podcast where we watch the newest TV shows and attempt to answer over the course of the episode whether or not you should add them to your queue. This month, we're breaking out our defibrillators, keeping those Instagram DMs open, and making sure we're wearing the right color pennies as we discuss the 2022 Netflix adaptation of Alice Oseman's hit webcomic, Heartstopper. I'm Alan, and I'm joined by the one chaotic straight friend in a friend group that's getting gayer by the minute. It's Magellan. <laughs> Hey, that's me just reading a book in the corner or trying to control people's lives. I'm one of or those, one one of those of guys. I don't know. Who could say, I guess there is more than one <laughs> technically straight person in the Heartstopper friend group. Huh. That's Yeah, I mean, something. it's, you know, it's all, it's all a spectrum. Who's straight, really? Uh, I'm trying to think of anybody straight in this comic. Only the bullies. Bad people. Uh, I mean, I just mean in life. Like, oh no one, it, no one. I don't think anyone's straight, really. Not a, not anymore. Not after no. the event. <laughs> <laughs> after everything that happened, man. Sheesh. Uh, when you said pennies, I thought that was like some sort of British slang, and then I realized that's like a thing that we call the Jersey things. Can I tell you what happened today? Uh, after dinner, yeah. I wrote this intro, and I sp- I stopped. I like had to sit on my bed and think really hard yeah, about what, what are to those call those. Things called? Yeah. No, because I knew they were called pennies, but I was like, they call them something else in the show. Do they call them vests? Because then if I say vests, is Magellan going to be like, they're not vests? So oh, like, what do I call them? Yeah, what did they call them in the show? I don't remember. And I wasn't able to find the scene from the sports yeah, day. Yeah, switch, switch thingies with me. I can't remember what it was. Pennies, the thing that you wear when you play sports at school. They're colored. That's what they are. Mm-hmm. Hi, everyone. Mm-hmm. Hi, Magellan. First of all, it's a new month. We're here in July of 2022. Yeah, the po- post Pride Month haze. <laughs> <laughs> I'm feeling particularly jubilant because I am thrilled to talk about this new show with you. Uh, yeah, me too. Should you watch? If you're new, by the way, hello. It's our show where we watch uh, new shows and tell people if they should watch them, like I said up top. And mm-hmm. we're talking Heartstopper. It's an adaptation of a webcomic, a webtoon, uh, a British webcomic webtoon called Heartstopper. Which is really fun to say. Magellan, first question. Why is it called Heartstopper? Uh, probably because it's like, oh. <laughs> you know, like that's the feeling. Like, oh. <gasps> the flutter, the mar- that moment when your heart yeah. stops. Yeah. 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 Uh, if you're not familiar with the series in general, just an overview. It's about Charlie and Nick. Uh, Charlie and Nick are two young British teenagers going to an all-boys school called Truham. Uh, I think it's Truham Grammar School, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and they sit next to each other in class, and they discover that they may or may not have feelings for each other. And it's about them, their friend group, and the trials and tribulations of being a young queer teen in the modern day. Uh, so naturally, we had to discuss it. I'm thrilled by the premise. I want to talk about what what we came into the show, what our knowledge of the show was going in. Um, and I'll speak to myself first. Um, so I had heard about this show on a podcast that I really like called Gender Reveal. I've um, you know recommended the Gender Reveal podcast on chats before on our other our main chats feed, um, and in that they do like a little recommendation segment, sort of like a chat segment, but it's more broad. Uh, and Tuck had spoken about Heartstopper and the idea of queer media that isn't about suffering and how nice and refreshing it is to like have something where mm. people mm-hmm. don't die, people don't like. There's just such Mm a massive number of stories featuring queer people where we are uh, either killed or harmed or troubled or heartbroken or whatever. Mm -hmm. And he was saying how wonderful it is to see a story where none of those things happen Uh, and how difficult it was to appreciate a story like that. Because we really do, as people who enjoy media, seek out like not conflict, but just things quote unquote happening and whether or not those things have to be good or bad is a question that I'm excited to talk about here. Mm -hmm. Um, So hearing that I had queued up the series for a while and then we had a gap in July and we said, well, we need to watch something. It is from just a few months ago, but it's still very much in the conversation. It got announced for a second season. The uh, web comic is on hiatus right now. It's funny. If you read the last chapter that was released of it uh, at the end, Alice Oseman is like, Hey, um, you know, I'm really, really burnt out doing this because also we have a Netflix show now and I'm like very heavily involved in that. Hmm. Weird how I, she's like 25, I think, and wow. doing a TV show and a webcomic. She's like, I don't, for some reason, I can't do both of these things. So I'm going <laughs> to stop. I'm going to just work on the show and try to like live my life for a bit. Um, so I totally get that. And uh, in doing that, I also read a bit of the webcomic, but um, we can talk about that as we go into this. 
because I read the first two volumes, which is what this season uh, covers. What about you, Majan? I didn't know anything about the show coming into <laughs> it just from what you told me. So I was excited to watch it. Um, and I thought it, I thought it was good. Uh, and I think we should talk about it. Absolutely. We were in a, uh, a like queer leftist bookstore in New York when I bought the first volume. And I distinctly remember the cashier when I told oh, her about it. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. I remember that. Mm-hmm. The cashier was like, uh, you know. I'm like, should I read this first or should I watch the rest? And she was like, very serious. She was like, very quiet, but otherwise, and then she went very serious and she was like, you should read it first. And I was like, oh, <laughs> uh-huh. hey, if you say so. Huh. Um, and so I read, I looked up like how much does the first season of the show cover and it's the first two volumes. So I read the physical uh-huh. first one and then I read the second one online. Um, and I went into it like knowing, okay, this is a low conflict story about mm-hmm. teen romance, super straightforward. And yeah. to just speak to the comic for a moment, uh, I really like the sort of light, sketchy art style of the comic. I think that that comes across in the series a little bit, how, yeah. um, you know, you see a lot of the graphical effects in the show. Like uh, fluttering are... on screen and off screen, yeah. Precisely. And uh, yeah. it's very funny. You know, it reads like, and this is not an, in any way an insult, but it reads like a web comic in that all of the jokes are like super snappy and like little bits and, uh, you know. They don't necessarily read like they're being said out loud. They read like you're gonna see these all screenshotted um, and put on Twitter. Or something. Yeah, very like on the on the surface references to things um, and like an earnestness in everything that is said that you can only really get when it's like one person's labor of love, uh, which is such like an infectious thing to mm-hmm. feel about something yeah yeah and it's very like it's just it's so light it's the breeziest thing in the world i read the whole first volume in like 45 minutes and then i read the second volume the next morning as soon as i woke up and i was like okay cool my question though having just read the web comic first was okay how do you turn this into eight episodes of netflix show like things mm-hmm. happen and there is conflict in the comic but like everything just works out and so going into right. the show i was constantly running in this 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 thought in my head of like can you have a show without any conflict? Can you have a show with no villain and no like motivating drive? Uh, and so that's something we have to, we're going to be talking about with the show. But uh, the last thing I want to say about the comic was, uh, so the last chapter of volume two is the, you no, know, the notorious, the beach trip, uh, which also is in, is in the series depicted in the series, just to not give any specifics there. And in the beach trip in the comic, uh, the two of them hold up like an iPhone and they listen together to Mac DeMarco on Spotify. And the reason I bring that up mm-hmm. is I'm like, uh, you know, that's so cool. They've never referenced real music in this comic so far. And I'm so uh-huh. curious how you would adapt this and how you would make music a central character because these are like these are teenagers who listen to a lot of music. Um, mm-hmm. And so that was my first thing of like, maybe the show is going to like have a lot of music. Um, so going into it, that was my like big question mark is mm-hmm. how are they going to incorporate music and sound in a, mm-hmm. what is are adapting from a visual medium? You um, told me coming into this that there were differences in the tone between the comic and the show that were for better and for worse. I'm I'm curious about how you were thinking about that as you were watching the show. Or yeah. does that give too much away? I think that gives a bit of... I, I'll, I'll have to flesh that out a little bit in the back half of our discussion. Okay. Um, but just to be broad, one of the things that the show does to differentiate itself is it inserts conflict where there wasn't any. Um, sure right or where there wasn't any that felt serious and it makes it a lot more grim and not grim but like definitely serious and and Mm -hmm. sad honestly you know i I had the pleasure of watching this with a really good friend both of us are queer and both of us were very much like invested in these characters plights and being like okay there are moments in this where i have to stop and like think about it because i don't feel comfortable just like slamming play like give me more serotonin like i did for parts of the show um but we can talk about that so that's that's my main Mm -hmm. thing is like in a way the show decided okay we have to make eight episodes and we have to like pull people in in the netflix way what better way to do that than to just add conflict um so i have mixed feelings about that gotcha that makes sense do you want to talk about the pilot let's do that let's talk about episode one so over the course of this episode this is uh this is listed in the timestamps. or what am i saying um throughout this episode of should you watch we will be covering with spoilers different parts of this season of Heartstopper. The timestamps for the discussion are in the show notes, so you can reference that there. 
Uh, but we're going to start talking about the pilot, so we will be spoiling that first episode. And and uh, in each section, we'll tell you uh, our thoughts on should you watch this show, given what we've told you so far. Yes. And so going, yeah, going, going into episode one, I'm immediately questioning, how do they cast these people? How do they make them look? How do they costume them? And what are they going to do mm-hmm. about the music? And mm-hmm. right from the gate, I was like, that's Charlie. You know, we just mm-hmm. like we see yeah. Joe Locke and we're like that that kid right there. I don't know why this feels right, but that's Charlie. <laughs> yeah, that um, casting was great. I read a couple of the comics that you sent me in, and I agree that he very much has the Charlie vibe. And uh, the ensemble is so big for what makes the show work um, and like the different the, the casting choices. Um, there's a lot of good YouTube videos of the cast and and uh, Osman herself like hanging out, dr- learning how to draw with each other, playing like funny games online because like the marketing team knew that's what people are coming for is like, let's watch these guys, these kids hang out. Um, and what was funny about that was there's a part where they like they're like, let's she's Alice is going to teach people how to draw uh, Nick and Charlie. And she was like, yeah, for Charlie, he's like the hardest character for me to draw because he's just his hair is just like a bunch of swirls. <laughs> he's like a very, very curly haired boy cartoonishly so in the in the comic so in the show they just had a a kid who's like you know very young fresh faced and has curly hair um and then another casting thing that i got right away out of the pilot was um so i was actually confused reading the comic about the difference between nick nick nelson the other main character and uh benjamin Mm -hmm. and ben Mm -hmm. because in the comic they look pretty similar um Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. The interesting thing I learned about Heartstopper was it's at it was at a weird time, a sort of like transitional time for Osman's art style. Um, because fun fact, I wanted to reveal to you on the on the podcast. Um, did you know that Heartstopper is a spinoff? Oh, really? Of what? Uh, the main comic that she does uh, is about Charlie's sister. Oh, so, okay. You think about like that's awesome. Isn't what? It? That's cool. Oh, well, I want to read that. Yeah, Charlie's totally sister is like one of the best characters in the show. Spoiler: what She's my favorite heck? side character in the show. Yeah, so the the What's comic that called. Uh, I just had it up. It's called Solitaire. The so Solitaire by Alice Osman was the original, and she had these two like you know the main character is like gay younger brother and his boyfriend, and she was like, "What uh-huh. if I made a whole thing about that?" And it's wildly more popular now. But <laughs> it's like a whole universe. Like a bunch of these characters have their own comics. Um, so I, I've huh. been like curious about exploring all of that stuff too in reading Heartstopper That's and cool. seeing where the conflict comes in. But yeah, so uh, I in the book I got I got Nick and uh, and Ben mixed up a lot, and mm-hmm. that was my first bit of like holy crap casting was the guy that got to play Ben, who is for folks at home Charlie's um, initial like fling that he's talking to at the beginning of the show. They make out in private. Uh, and this relationship mm-hmm. seems he's like it very may not controlling be controlling and demeaning to Charlie. Yeah, he's terrible. I think the guy who plays him is amazing at being a piece of garbage. Like I just hate him. <laughs> uh, yeah. Sebastian Croft is the actor's name. It's like you just hate it. Like you maybe. I think what the comic does that's different though is uh, they don't make him too detestable right away. You're just like, right. oh, that's right. a, he's a little forward. Okay, but. Just yeah. the way that Ben carries himself in the show, you're like, this guy seems bad. And the more you learn about him, you're like, this guy is bad. <laughs> it's a horrible person. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And it's that classic, you know, young, early queer relationship where you're like, I will take what I can get. This person wants to be intimate with me and makes me feel important, except when yeah. we actually try to talk to each other, it seems like nothing's there. Yeah, right. Um. And then we start getting a lot of like the sort of visual touches. Did you w- find the all of the like graphical touches, the the leaves? The leaves are a huge motif in the comic. Did you find all of that stuff like charming, or uh, did it get in the way of like trying to just watch the series? My initial impression of it was like, okay, that's kind of cute, I guess. Like not having the context of it in the comic, um, like okay, that's cute. They're giving us this little visual cues, these cues when like characters like each other. That's useful. Yeah. It makes it clear to the audience. We're not wondering really at any point, like, does this person like this person? We're just sort of watching relationships unfold and watching characters figure each other out. Um, so I think what it does is it emphasizes that there's like a little bit of magic in this world, just or like, you know, romance. And it also emphasizes like there aren't secrets here. 
you know, we're, we're right. showing you what's going on and, and what you need to know. Um, but I, I don't know. I thought it was like a little like, okay, that's kind of cute. And then when I read bits of the comic, I had a greater appreciation for, um, you know, adaptation is like a, an interesting art form or like mm-hmm. kind of sub art form within film. Um, when I was in college, I like took a creative writing class. that was specifically about adapting fiction to film. Um, and it's interesting to become acquainted with the source material and be able to see like, okay, how do you, especially when something comes from a graphic novel or like another visual medium where there are these distinct visual, um, choices that you want to reflect in the show. So I, I, I developed an appreciation for like those artistic choices. I think I ended up liking the other kind of visual choices that were from the graphic novel format a little bit better, like the way that the texts showed up on the screen sometimes or the panels that would happen. Um, Or like when Charlie's imagining a worst case scenario and suddenly there are all these like harsh crosshatch pencil lines around the world. Um, That stuff I thought was pretty cool. Uh, And once I'd seen the comic, those little like leaves and things were a nice reminder to me of like, yeah, that did look really cool in the comic and it's still kind of cool here, but it's like better knowing what it's trying to emulate. If that makes sense. Absolutely. Um, um but I, I think, think they were also visually the show's really cool. I agree. Yeah. And I think it, it even lightens up on the comic panel stuff throughout the series as if the, uh, the pilot is like, hey, we really need to convince you that this is an adaptation of a comic. And then eventually they like, like I either stopped noticing it or it stopped happening as much, uh, mm-hmm. the, the comic panel transitions. But you do still get yeah. lots of like visual flourishes and they use it really think, subtly later on. Yeah, definitely. You're saying- Were you going to say more about that? Sorry. No, I just think that like when they use it, it really matters. And you mentioned magic and it does almost feel like there is an element of magic to- to the series mm-hmm. over time. Yeah, I think the other thing to recognize the show for is the way that it embellishes visuals with like extra things that television and film can do uh, mm-hmm. because the comic is in black and white mm-hmm. and this show makes excellent use of color um, throughout. And I think the like the lighting choices of the show are really striking. Um and the way that it uses like shallow depth of field. And it, it's just like a very, very pretty show to look at. Um, and that is, those are a set of choices that are like original to the show that are carrying forward the tone of the comic without undermining it or clashing with it, which is uh, a tricky thing to do in an adaptation. I think they handle it pretty well from what I've seen anyway. Definitely. And it's a really hard thing to communicate all of that color and stuff in like in a television show because it's not just like the coloring and the framing, but this is a well-directed show too. You know, even I'm just like thumbing through the pilot right now and there's so many memorable like shots, even like Charlie and his sister sitting on the bus and like the bright yellow barrier separating them from the rest of the kids is like clean visual storytelling without beating it over your head. It's just like, Mm -hmm. yeah, this is a a thing that if you pause a frame and look at it, you're going to consider um, yeah. similar to how in the comic every moment feels like you're going to screenshot this crop it and send it to your friends on tumblr uh because that's right. what it's for that's part of the purpose right. of it right. um but yeah we like learn we meet all these different characters um we also of course meet uh our our, our deuteragonist nick um who is just such a nice. sweet just such a, <laughs> thank you <laughs> thank you thank you i relearned that word recently uh the sh- the comic is definitely and both both the comic and the show are about Charlie Charlie's perspective yeah yes and I've heard things about where it goes later that make me interested in seeing more of that because so far if I have anything big to say about Charlie's characterization it's that they're holding like a lot of his stress close to the chest like they do not show yeah. the bullying he experienced yeah. before the events of the story yeah we um, talk a lot about it but we don't see it. Exactly. And he experiences bullying bullying in the show, but not to the extent that like he was traumatized the way that he says he was and that he actually was beforehand. Right. Um, right. 
and so he's a guy that's like holding on to a lot of like stress and and worry about himself. He's one of the only out gay people in his entire school, which I imagine right. is extremely scary. Even like the con- the show acknowledges that even like the process of coming out is not as simple as you do it and then you're done. It's kind of a gradual process. I think there's an episode later about another character that uh, mm-hmm. handles that even more elegantly. But mm-hmm. it's not just something that you like have a big moment with your parents and then you tell everyone in school and it's fine. It's like, oh, some people still don't know. Some people uh, don't talk to me anymore. Some people, uh, you know, come out to me because I came out. Like there's just so many different elements to that, even though it seems like right. something really simple. Right. Um, but I really liked Nick and I and I thought that the early stuff with Ben here like very much set him up as some sort of a villain. This is another thing where I was like, OK, the show is leaning harder into this. Um, but it still has the like l- short, quick bits of comedy, like the pen explosion on Nick's hands, uh, which is directly ripped from the comic. Most of the first episode is exactly from the comic, like word for word. Even uh, I like the part. This is one little line that they changed. I, I know I'm going to stop comparing it to the comic too much, but uh, he gets the pen explode on his hand, and Charlie's like, oh, he's like, oh, I should get it as a tattoo. And the comic, Charlie goes like, you're not allowed to do that. That's against school code. You can't get tattoos. (laughs) You can't get blue pen tattoos. That's funny. And then the last big thing that's a change is the new and improved emphasis on another relationship in the show, which is Elle and Tao. Um, Tao is uh, one of Charlie's best friends, and Elle is also one of Charlie's best friends who recently transitioned and moved to the girls' school nearby. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. And so we get the sort of like questioning queer perspective the trans perspective we get a lot of like different types of diversity in this friend group uh yeah. but the comic like does not delve into ellen tau even like 10 percent as much as this does and right away mm. even that first scene with the juice where he was like you know i, I keep buying her, her juice even though she doesn't go to our school anymore is like a really nice way to describe like what it's like when some you feel like somebody has left your life but they're still the same person like I'm used to to Elle coming here. I'm used to her being our friend at lunch and I'm used to buying her juice and none of like, she's still our friend, but she's not here physically anymore. And the difficulty of that, especially as a young person. Um, And they actually got a trans actress, which I thought was very cool. You know, they Mm -hmm. did the work, like I said, Mm -hmm. they did the work where they needed to do it. Right. Um, So those are the big like character moments in this one. Then we also, of course, get Charlie's sister, the icon herself, permanently (laughs) holding a little beverage (laughs) at all times. (laughs) <laughs> and throwing shade at her brother. Loving shade, yeah. of course. Um, and then just, yeah, the like Nick stuff starting to escalate. Uh, I made a comment. I think this happens in the first episode when Nick finds out that, uh, you know, Ben is like being terrible to uh, to Charlie and he confronts him. Yeah, that happens in, the, in this episode. He doesn't hit him. And I think what's one of the really like nice, subtle things about Heartstopper is it depicts like teen stress and angst in a way that doesn't mode, like uh, promote violence towards each other. It's like conflict management in a like nonviolent way pretty often, uh, at least this yeah. early in the series. Yeah, th- th- at first, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, which makes it a big deal as, it, as that changes. But right. for now, it's like, oh, yeah, Nick just like tells this guy to go away because the stakes haven't escalated just yet. Um, yeah. So I just – yeah, I found this like really cute. I love the colors like you said. I love – Nick and Charlie right away. They're just so, they're just cute. This is a very yeah. Cute, they're cute such sweet, show. sweet kids. You want the world for them. They clearly like each other a lot. It it's from the very beginning. You're like, oh, okay, oh yeah, you're gonna oh, get it. I want to watch. I want to watch this. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so it's yeah. Th- that sweetness gets you through a lot. And I think what it sets up is it's not a question of. Are Nick and Charlie going to get together? Are you kind of, if you're, you've seen stories like this before, you know that that's what's going to happen. It's a question of when and how and what happens along the way there uh, to them finding each other romantically. So I went into this pilot really enamored. I thought the music was great. So many good pop needle drops, indie needle drops. They clearly put a lot of good effort into all of those choices um fantastic casting i was i was sold for minute one pbh yeah. by you no agreed yeah i i i think you'll know from the pilot if you want to watch the show like it's very clear 
the themes it's interested in, the tone it wants to set, the stylistic choices it's going to make. If you like the pilot, you'll like the show. If you don't, you won't. Uh, and I liked it, and I wanted to watch more of it. I think to the like, it, how much conflict is there in this series question? Um, the most conflict in this episode is that uh, is that his his uh, boyfriend is an asshole, and if you're like, okay, that's yeah. kind of like the height of drama for a lot of this show. Um, just like be aware that the show is holding some more serious things close to the chest. And mm -hmm. if you're like, okay, is that it? Is that like all the conflict? Like it does go from there. So that may be more of a sell or less of a sell, depending on who you are. Just be aware of that. Yeah. Well, and I think it also maintains throughout the show um, the feeling that we get in a few scenes where we see Charlie and then Nick going to like draft their Instagram DM to each other and then delete yes. it and then be like, oh, well, should I say it this way? And then delete it. And like that's a sort of conflict too that mm -hmm. stays throughout the show. Um, so there is like you're saying a sort of escalation of like physical yeah, conflict. the physical conflict and like the heroes and villains of the story, I guess. Um, but there is also that still that sort of like intimate, anxious, mundane, small kind of like. Oh God, is he going to text back? Did I say something stupid? I'm going to send five texts in a row and see what he says. Kind of, kind of conflict too. <laughs> in a, <laughs> Which in a is way it's delightful. I love that stuff. It's delightful. It's relatable. And in a way it's more yeah. realistic than, than it like obviously euphoria or something like that, that heightens the drama yeah, to an extreme. Right. right because right, right. Exactly. even though some people might say like, Oh, you know, high school, isn't this like bucolic and relaxing and fun? It's like, well, sometimes, yeah, the biggest stress that you have for the week is, like, does he text me back? Or, like, am I right. queer? Am I bi? Right. What's going on? Like, those are the we'll biggest see what stressors. what YouTube says. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. So I think when, yeah, when you define conflict and you say, like, is Heartstopper a show without conflict? It's, like, it's a show without, like, long stand. Well, no, that's not even true. I don't think any of that. Uh, you can't say it doesn't have conflict in any real way. I think it's a show where like things will work out per per yeah you you're confident that things will work out and it doesn't have it has the rom-com pacing to an extent of like things are going great oh god something went wrong now things are great again but like in a more true to life way um mm -hmm. like it has the sort of contours of of a romantic comedy type of thing. Um, but yeah, at a pace and, and with situations that are just more realistic, um, which mm -hmm. I think is, is refreshing. I think we should talk about episodes two through six. Does that yeah. sound good to you? That sounds fantastic. Um, yeah. So essentially across episodes two through six, we see this budding romance between Charlie and Nick um, Charlie's trying to gauge, does Nick like me? We're starting to hang out more and more. Is he gay? Is he queer? What is happening? And Nick is asking the same questions about himself um, and trying to sort out what his sexuality is, uh, what to do about his feelings for Charlie. And so they end up starting a relationship that at this point in the series, they're keeping secret as uh as nick sort of sorts this stuff out for himself because he's captain of the rugby team he has all these like you know shitty outwardly homophobic friends and then friends who are like apathetic about the homophobia around them as well mm -hmm. um so it's a hostile environment in which to be openly queer and then um yeah each episode there's like kind of a situation that we have to navigate as we start to date each other oh this girl asked me out and i have to let her down easy we're at a party and we're gonna make out and you know stuff like that um it's it's a very sweet chunk of the show a lot of moments of like oh 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 this is great <laughs> i love that um, yeah, yeah, it just it's it it's a it's a heart warmer, not only a heart stopper, but a heart warmer. Yeah, 
in a lot of ways. I think one of the things I found really heartwarming about this middle arc was the one of the good additions of the show was to give Elle not only something to do, but characters to do things with. Uh, yeah. Because they introduced Tara and Darcy, um, who are the yeah. first two girls. She is not getting along well at uh, her girls' school be- uh, because she's really like anxious there as a, as an, a trans woman and also just like a new student at the same time. How do I make friends? Her teacher literally tells her, "I need you to make friends." At some point, you can't go through high school alone. Uh, and so she just like coincidentally runs into Tara and Darcy. Um, Tara is in the well, both of them are actually in the comic. Um, I think I had you read the, um, the dance, yeah, the, the arc party with scene. the party, yeah. Um, but it's less about like Tara and Darcy are these like, these out and about lesbians who like talk and joke about their their queerness and their friendship and all of that stuff, and it's more like it's a played as a not a punchline but like a uh, a funny twist in the comic that like oh by the way, this girl that Nick liked when he was in elementary school is gay. This is like revealed in a different order in the comic it's actually revealed at the party i believe uh at harry's party so because he just goes up to her and he's like hey by the way everyone thinks that we can still be together do you want to be together i don't know if i'm straight anymore and she's like oh i've been gay dude <laughs> Look at the, and that's the thing that they kind of like <laughs> right. t- completely tweaked for the show because that's a very funny c- panel in that you right. go like haha that's like great what a good twist that doesn't make sense if real people said it like that uh-huh. Uh, right. just like uh, off the cuff like hey by the way so instead yeah. they make her the and uh and darcy these like side characters who are invested in uh l's whole situation with tau um which is yeah the big invested in that and and also there's like a really cool relationship between tara and nick as he's starting to navigate his se- sexuality where he's like confiding in her first i just i really liked how their relationship develops over these episodes. Um, And it's like, feels so essential to the show that it was surprising to me to read the comic with the party. um, And to see that, like what I thought was one of the coolest pivotal moments was like not in the comic at all, at all, which is, which is the moment where um, set the scene. Nick has had that conversation with Tara and then there's the dance floor and there's the church's song clear as blue and it's you know it's building the drop and you're like something's gonna happen and then he looks over and he sees Tara and Darcy kissing on the dance floor and it's just this moment of like yeah I could do that that like it can be okay it can be and that easy awesome uh and I was like fuck yeah this is great um so it's kind of a surprise that that wasn't in the comic, but a, a really welcome addition to the show. And I'm glad that those characters have so much uh, airtime in, yeah. the, in the series. Yeah. That, um, that party, which takes place in episode three is like the most pivotal set piece I'd say in the first two volumes of the comic. It's, um, you know, it's the first time that Nick and, uh, and Charlie kiss. And so, you know, I, I was super curious how they portrayed it. Cause also they make um, Harry a character earlier on in the comic than they do in the show. Um, he's less of a, a trash man in the comic. They like zoom right. Once he becomes a character, he's just the worst person in the world. He talks like this. Hey, hey, uh, he sound he like sounds snobby. If that makes sense. I mean, I don't know much about the different types of British accents, but he just sounds. He just exudes jackassery, and he hosts a party in a ho- his birthday party's in a hotel, which you know that he's one of those guys. His sixteenth birthday. But yeah, man, that. So Magellan knows this about me. Claire's Blue is one of my favorite songs. It's my favorite church's song. It's one of the best drops in all of music. Um, and I heard it playing, and I told the friend I was watching with, I was like, they started the song right towards the drop. Are they going to, like, they have to do something right at the drop, right? And you feel it barreling towards that. And then when the kiss is not Nick and Charlie, but it is instead Ellen Darcy, you're like, not sorry, not Ellen Darcy, um, Tara and Darcy. Tara and Darcy. You're like, oh my God. I'm like, I want to cry. And then we cut back to Nick and he's <laughs> yeah. like emotional. You never see a show do that. You never see the pivotal kiss be of side characters because, yeah. and that's beautiful. The, the use of music here justifies the show's existence to me. Um, it's just incredible. The lighting, this is what is called in some circles, um, gay lighting. The like <laughs> the use of neon <laughs> here, uh-huh. gay, or, gay or bisexual lighting, depending on who it is. Um, it's just so heightened and so beautiful. And it's like, 
you know, and Am- John asked me, he said, I wish I had watched the show with you to hear your reactions. And this is a big moment where I was mm-hmm. like, I got out of my seat and I like yelled into a pillow and I was like, fuck, come on, yeah. let's go. <laughs> it's just yeah. so, it's euphoric, honestly. Um, yeah. And sometimes, you know, being a teenager is like that. Sometimes you just have a moment that feels like the biggest effing moment of your life. Um, yeah. And and I love that. Again, it's not, it's not them, but so similar to that, uh, that musical moment where it feels like it's barreling towards a conclusion, uh, Heartstopper just starts to accelerate the pace of Nick and Charlie's relationship. And again, I love that it's not barreling towards like, are they going to get together? But it's an inevitability, like a celestial inevitability that these two boys mm-hmm. will fall in love and will be able to confess to each other eventually that what they're experiencing is love. Um, I really love that a lot. I just, I know I'm saying the word love a lot, but that's like one of the central concepts in the series. Uh, yeah. Yeah. and through three three to six is also where or two to six is where we get a lot of like just people hanging out i think that's like a big benefit of the show too is it's good to just like sit back and watch i don't know uh like when l and tau have a movie night and it's sitting on his bed on their his laptop watching arrival and it's like that's uh-huh. that's somebody's movie night man that like yeah he, he talks about yeah. like i want you to come over and watch all these like bad movies that you're not gonna like because i'm a in high school and the way I define my personality is that I watch a lot of movies. Like Uh who hasn't been that person at some point? Yeah. Um, So there's just a lot of clever, like, Oh, that is, that is how it be. And everybody messages each other. They really do a lot of good. Like you were saying with uh, like the text messages and the overlays and people stressing about texts and getting excited. Like, Oh, he texted me back. Or there's like good autocorrect humor in there even briefly. Like it's just, Mm-hmm. somebody did a, so much work making the texting feel act- they even used like actual Instagram DMs uh, mm-hmm. to convey that uh, yeah. so I just the like hanging out factor in 2 through 6 was like delightful to me yeah I agree and I, I think overall the way the show interacts with technology um, and the internet feels really truthful uh and not like a boomer wrote it <laughs> you know right right um because there's a group text where some texts happen out of order and people have to catch up to each other um mm-hmm. and there's moments where like i said before nick is watching a youtube video about bisexuality to like learn what it is mm-hmm. um is that, that's in this batch of episodes, right? I think it is. Yeah, yeah. yeah, it, yeah, yeah. I don't remember the exact one, but it's in here. Mm-hmm. Um, or, yeah, when he Googles <laughs> moment, one of my favorite moments that I texted you about, he's watching Pirates of the Caribbean with his mom, Ugh. and his mom's like, I know you always like this because of Kira Knightley. And then we get this perspective shot where he looks at Kira Knightley and then he looks at Orlando Bloom and then it cuts to the computer where he's typing like, what is bisexuality or something yeah, like that? Yep. Or like, am I bisexual? Um, which is like, yeah, something that a 11th grade kid would Google if they were like, what? what? Um, and I think it was just cool to see the internet play such uh such a major role and such an a positive role and a positive role in in these kids lives and negative too like we also see for example uh when tara posts a picture of her and darcy uh kissing on instagram and then we see the couple of comments that she deletes because they're homophobic um and i think that's good too because it shows us that like you know, it's not universally positive. There are benefits and drawbacks, but I think what the show makes clear is like the sense of self knowledge and community that these characters feel with each other uh, is made possible by technology that links them directly to each other and directly to sources of information. Um, And I think that's so important to, to talk about when you're telling like a 21st century queer story right Mm -hmm. um so i i thought that was well done and and really interesting and cool to see unfold over these episodes i uh i just finished watching miss marvel which wrapped up its first season and uh that series in in, uses tiktok a lot to be like oh she's a teenager and so like a lot of plot development about like what do people think of miss marvel happens via tiktok which i do think is accurate but is just portrayed in a much more ham-fisted way compared to this because it's like 
everybody, every main character and side character in the show seems to make a TikTok where they just face the camera and say, like, I think Miss Marvel is this. And it's like, yeah, that's not how TikTok necessarily works. A lot of it is, yeah, people just, like, talk at their camera and, like, go on a soapbox. But there's, like, so much more to it. And I think that this, yeah, it shows the full spectrum of, like, the internet is not just even Instagram DMs. It's text messages. It's, like, Google searches. It's YouTube uh, YouTubers. Um, and so that brings me to, like, something I love. I do love Nick realizing his bisexuality in this because he's very certain that he still likes girls. And he's just not able to, like, fully let go of his, like, masculinity with the rugby club. We get, like, some good r- r- rugby right. scenes in here also. Um mm-hmm. I think episode four is the actual like big rugby game. Um, really great directing on that. But uh, this is where I started thinking like, you know, which is part of what they expect you to do with a teen romance. Which character do I relate to the most? Um, I know you said you felt a little bit of kinship with Isaac as the like nice guy who just <laughs> like supports people and reads books. Um, <laughs> yeah, I think probably I I felt the most attachment to to. Uh, is it Tao or Tao? It's Tao. Tao. I think I probably felt the most attachment to Tao. Um, oh, buddy. If we'll I'm, talk. If I'm not <laughs> making a joke. <laughs> like, And not in like a, this is the best character, but in like a, yeah, I can see your flaws and I I, I understand them. <laughs> yeah. No, that's a, I, um, I really, I respect your honesty there because Tao is yeah. a, a flawed, like a flawed character in a very really realistic way. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so I, I I love that you you can say that. I, I I felt myself going back and forth between Charlie and Nick honestly, because um, uh-huh. I definitely have and the. Why like, do you think that was? Yeah. So I think I have in general the personality type of Charlie where I am like often I'm constantly thinking about my presence in a group of people and like am I taking up too much space? Am I annoying people? Am I weird? Am I like too gay? For example, with certain people like. And his relationship with his parents seems really good. I love his relationship with his dad and the implication that, like, his dad, yeah, like, s- supports him but, like, doesn't have the words to talk about it exactly. Yeah. That felt real to me. Totally. And it's all in, like, moments where Charlie comes to the car and his dad is, like, you know, 10 o'clock. And, he, and like, they go goes to Harry's party in episode three and the dad's, like, 10 o'clock. And he's, like, what about 11? And the dad's, like, 10 o'clock. Um, <laughs> partly because he's a parent and partly because like this is a child who has been bullied so much that you're like worried when he leaves the house so like right, you feel right. more protective of him and uh, but he's still there he still like, wants to talk to him um, so I mostly felt like Charlie but at the same time I had the questioning of my identity be very 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 similar to Nick's um, I did not have a like traditional like hair side part bisexual YouTuber guy be like, here's what bisexual is, and here's when I realized it was me. That was not my experience at all. I'm sure that's plenty of people, right. but I thought that was kind of goofy, honestly. Um, for me, though, it was just, like, that exact same thing and, like, Googling, like, uh, you know, hot guy and also following the right people on Twitter, you know? Like, just right, sure. that exact thing, but for Twitter, was how I uh, started to connect those wires in my brain. Yeah. But the repeated sense of like no i have to be this i can't be that and i can't be with charlie because the because girls like me but oh like oh this is not that girls liked me that much in school but you know same idea of like i think i like girls but there must be some there must be a word for how i feel and i love how that wraps around towards the end of the series by the way but we'll talk about that in a sec um yeah i wanted to look back also on the uh the rugby stuff i think that it's really funny that he managed to make like an, a quote unquote action scene still hilarious. Uh, we, my friend and I, when we were watching the rug, the big rugby game in episode, um, I think that was episode four. Yeah. Uh, we were like, Oh man, all the guys on the other team look like they're 30. And then immediately it cuts to Nick and he's like, how old are the guys on the other team? Cause I think they got 30 year old actors <laughs> to be like the, on the rugby team. Yeah. Uh, some of them look pretty old. They were like, like older men yes it was like hilarious um and yeah just like all that stuff the 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 two big um like i i just enjoy the rugby in general because it's a sport that's at the center and like sports are in nick's life a big part a big part of nick's life so it's cool that they focused in on them uh but the two original characters to the show are isaac who we mentioned who's like not really a character i mean he's very supportive he knows everybody's gay before they say it. He's, like, there and present and friendly enough 
He doesn't have a plot, though. Um, and then there's Imogen, who is completely original to the show. Um, oh, and this, interesting. Yeah, huh. and this is where I started to be like, oh, why Why did this is a conflict that we literally added? Yeah, because, that's conflict for conflict's sake. That's, that's strange. It, huh. it also solves itself. Like, right. it effortlessly solves itself because Imogen is a girl who, like, very clearly has a crush on Nick. And all of his other friends, including Harry, are like, you know, you should probably get with her. She clearly likes you. And he feels pressured by that. Um, and then the most delicious cringe I've ever felt in recent memory uh, was when she was like, by the way, my dog died. Anyways, what did you want to tell me? You wanted to break. You don't like me. Or like He's like about to tell her he doesn't like her. But she tells him that her dog died. And he just feels that tension of like, oh, shit, I can't say it anymore. And you worry that he's going to like start dating her because he feels so uncomfortable saying it. But then it just works out. It just like cleans itself up. And it's like you straight up didn't need this character in the mm-hmm. series. Yeah, I mean, yeah. It's like not really a needed conflict because then it's totally gone. But I think to play Imogen's advocate for a second here... Um, I think what it can do if we choose to see value in this is it distinguishes Nick's actions from Ben's actions, right? Because Ben like has a girl that he's making out with and not telling Charlie about. And Nick is like, okay, I'm going to like do the right thing and be honest with people and make sure that everybody is in the know and approach this, you know, as a good guy. Um, and I think the other thing that Imogen's presence can accomplish is it's just another example of showing the viewers of the show, like it can be fine. Like you can be honest with someone and say, I don't like you like that. And then life is okay. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and that, that's kind of nice. Um, so not a necessity, but also not, Imogen doesn't detract from the show, and I think she can fit in with some of the larger themes. She can play Um, with the rest of it. She is funny. Yeah, yeah. And I think the actress does a good job. Um, But you could have made it like a seven-episode show and accomplished a lot of the same stuff without this plot line, probably. I think that Nick, to your point, fills the the gaps that... uh, What's the ex's name again? I keep forgetting his name. Ben. Ben. He feels the what are the what are the biggest the, like issues with Ben? First of all, he you know kisses without consent, which is gross, yes, yes. and horrible. Um, he's a terrible listener, uh, and he he wants to keep Charlie a secret in he a, wants to keep him a secret, of, like mean way, and embarrass him in public when he tries to make it public. You know, yes, because right. he's so and as Charlie says later, it's because he's so afraid of his own homosexuality. He's terrified of it, and so he can't possibly let people know about it. Whereas Nick is, like, big on consent, is a great listener, is deeply concerned with Charlie's mental state. And uh, so he's, like, everything that that uh, that Ben is not, which I think is, is, like the, is the essential parallel there. So, like, yeah, I guess in, in the sense mm-hmm. that Imogen is underlining that more, she does belong here. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, yeah, I really, I really just enjoyed all this stuff. How did you feel about this... Um, this episode six milkshake pop up. This was a little strange, right? <laughs> They're like all <laughs> hanging out at a milk. It's like they just had an extra set, or they had some extra set budget. Oddly beautiful milkshakes. <laughs> yeah, it's like, yeah, whatever this was. This is where me and my my uh, my group chat all go and tell each other that we're all dating and we all love each other. Except Tao, who becomes a sort of tertiary protagonist in this. I don't have a tur tertagonist, maybe. I don't have that term. <laughs> yeah, that something word. like that. Um, Tao is a, a troubled, uh, a troubling character in some ways, but also a relatable character because he understands that Charlie feels a lot of strong things about Nick. Uh, he worries at first that Nick is straight. He's really uh, oblivious to the fact that it, like everyone else knows before he does that they're dating and that they like each other. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so because of that obliviousness, he thinks this friendship is going to fall apart. I need to keep yeah. them apart and becomes a sort of like villain in a way too, because mm-hmm. he's so deeply afraid of like, I already lo- in a way lost L from our immediate friend group. How do right. I keep this group together? I get it. 
we've all like deep down been Tao in some way and been like, yeah, other people are happy, but like this is getting in the way of what made me happy. And mm -hmm. I don't feel like this is going to work out. And I'm more, and it's also like, it's coming from a place of concern for Charlie. It's like, you've, your best friend has been hurt yeah. so many times. You don't even want him yeah. to engage with this. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's like, it's a mix of, motivations there's a selfishness to it there's a protectiveness that is condescending in its way um there's yeah a sort of worry about like am i going to be alone i think it's a pretty complex characterization um which is cool to see mm -hmm. and yeah like tao makes a series of choices where it's like bud <laughs> you, we can just talk to each other you don't mm -hmm. You don't have to do that that way. Um, but, you know, it's teens, right? It, it feels true to life. Exactly. We've, I've done yeah. I've done better and worse <laughs> in my own life. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think that that actor plays it really well, and uh, I like... And the hairstylist is doing a great job, too. That swoopy hairstyle is bananas. That's not it's even awesome. in the comic. I thought that was them, like, adapting his hair, but his hair's normal in the comic. He wears a hat. <laughs> Why? I love it, though. It's I love the hair. It reminds so me a lot. Gosh. This show actually has a lot of similarities to Scott Pilgrim versus the World, the movie. Uh, I thought about that movie earlier. Yeah. Yeah. Like with the yeah. sister, you know, the like sister who knows everything and the main character who's like really anxious. Like there are parallels. Um, mm -hmm. It's sort of a gay Scott Pilgrim versus the world in, without the <laughs> fighting, I guess. Yes. Um, but then, yeah, the last thing with these episodes is just the music stuff in episode six, which uh, we get to see like everybody getting ready for a concert we get some more uh, uh, of the girls, of the lesbians <laughs> being friends mm -hmm. and worrying about each other and being supportive for each other. It's a good, like, side character spotlight episode. Yeah. And then the absurd milkshake pop-up is uh, hilarious. Yeah. Also, when they go on group dates, what does Isaac do? Yeah, where was Isaac? He's there. He comes with them. I oh. think. But, like... To the milkshake thing? I'm going to double check. Them. I, mean, I don't think don't. Isaac was there. Then that feels bad too. It's just like we don't invite Isaac to this. I don't know. I mean, I guess yeah, it's a date. Yeah. Um, but I, I did, I did think of like if you're gonna, yeah, he's not there. You're right. If you're gonna introduce Isaac, then like I don't know, maybe they're gonna make him a character in the second one. We saw later. We talk. We can talk about the book that he reads <laughs> in episode eight. <laughs> but I guess I have theories. I have Isaac-based theories. Okay. Good. Um, you want to zoom out one more time and uh, talk about the full series, including seven and eight. Uh, yeah, I think so. Let's do that. Okay. Well, what's your should you watch recommendation by this point at the end of six? Do you still feel the same way about the show? So, yes. Um, at this point, you may be saying, where do, again, the conflict seems to be gone. Everything just worked out. They just had a nice band recital. The show's almost over. Right. How are they going to possibly right. introduce stuff? I got And they've like basically resolved the Tara Darcy conflict yes. almost too quickly, I would yes. say. And so um, you may be thinking, yeah. what plot, what conflict is even left? And so to that, I would just say, uh, watch one more episode. If you're like, <laughs> where's the stress coming from? Yeah. So, yeah, I think you could, you could, you'd, if you're watching now, you're, uh, you're bought in. It's, it's an ensemble show. It's a show where all the characters are funny and interesting and they do funny, interesting things to nice indie music. That's like what two to six basically is. There's conflict on the way there. Uh, what about you? Yeah, I think this is the part of the show that I enjoyed the most. Mm -hmm. uh, this stretch where where the hurdles that we need to jump over are not life or death, but you can understand how a character in this position would feel like this is the most important thing in my life right now. Mm -hmm. Like, oh my God, I have this date with Imogen and I, uh, I got to go to Charlie's birthday and make sure I get him a gift and I just don't know how to talk about my feelings. Like... That's the stuff that I think this show does the very best. And then I think that's there's enough of that in the last two episodes to make me say, like, if you like that and you want that, you should watch the show. Um, mm -hmm. But it does kind of try to do some, like, TV stuff in episodes seven and eight, which we can talk about now. Yeah. So episode yeah. seven is called Bully, which is is explaining what's going on with this one. Mm -hmm. um, you may be wondering. Yeah, the well, hey, titles yeah. are pretty straightforward. <laughs> Just gonna say, they're all kiss they're all titles of chapters. Mm -hmm. Yeah, secret yeah. friend, girls, kiss, crush. Yeah, 
So bully is when bullying starts to happen. If you're wondering, hey, there's a lot of straight people who know that these kids are queer. Why is there no, like, homophobia? Well, guys, episode 7 contains a big, fat, heaping helping of 20 straight minutes of intense homophobia. Um, yeah. In, like, different systemic ways. I think there are moments in the series where the homophobia is, like, really hammy. It's like, like, oh, you're gay? Like, that's weird. Like, that kind of homophobia. Yeah, what is it like to be gay? And it's like, what? <laughs> yeah, I put my arm around you and ask you, what, like, do you like my friend? He's he's a guy. You like guys, right? Like, I have heard people talk like this in real life. It's rare enough, even in high school, especially these days, to talk like that. Yeah. That just isn't realistic right. homophobia. What is realistic is the persistence that Harry has towards bullying these two guys um, and making them not only feel isolated, but feel like bad for existing. Uh, and it just gets so targeted that like this episode honestly un- like made me feel gross and unhappy. And I was like, I don't mm-hmm. even like, w- is Heartstopper just like a sh- Like this just becomes a lot of suffering out of nowhere, uh, which was really tough for me to watch. Can I ask you a question about that? Of course. Um, do you think that that is like, is that a useful thing to introduce into the show to address? Or do you feel like it was done handled poorly or like a kind of rough sketch of those things? Uh, like, is it just that it feels uncomfortable because those things are uncomfortable or is the show also mishandling its portrayal of homophobia in that way? Uh, this is the key question of the uh, Heartstopper, the comic versus the show, because none of this is as serious in the comic at all. Mm. Uh, watching the show, it gets a lot more intense. In real life, this gets a lot more intense. So it begs the question, do I want young queer kids to believe that love is whatever you want it to be and it can work out and it's beautiful? Or do I want them to see like fairly accurate depictions of what it is in real life? It's basically, are you saying, do you want like a form, like a, a fantastical reality or a real reality? And I think you need both. I think young people need to see both. Um, there's yeah. value in the like beautiful, sweet two to, episodes two to six and the comic style of like, oh, we're worried, but it's probably fine. Oh, everything's going to work out in the end. But mm-hmm. like Seven not only introduces like real life accurate homophobia, but also like the toll that it takes on your mental health in the long term. In ways that are really subtle, but these are what made me the most uncomfortable. So something I learned um, that I'm going to just talk about a little bit like mild spoilers for later in the comic. Um, Charlie develops an eating disorder as a result of partly partly as a result of the events of this episode Um, because he's worried about what people think about him. He's worried about the way he looks. He spends the beginning of the episode staring in the mirror. We start getting a Mm. sense the way he talks about food and stuff that he's like changing his relationship with food. Um, Hmm. so he does go on, that goes on to become a major plot line. That's the Hmm. sort of thing where I'm like, if you watch hard star for the show and you're like, I should read the comic, but you're like, uh, a lot of people I know, very sensitive to stories about eating disorders, especially in young teens. You might just need to stop. Um, because Hmm. that's like, that's too real. You know, that's like, and it begs the question of like, how much do I want to see this? Is it worth it to watch a kid suffer? Is it worth it to watch Tao, like get his ass beat by Harry? Because he doesn't know how to be what his friend wants anymore, uh, mm. and I just I don't I don't have a firm answer for that. That's my that's my my biggest struggle with the series. Yeah, yeah, it's it's a challenging question that I obviously don't have perspective to answer. I just have more questions about it mm-hmm. um, because I I wonder, you know, I would imagine the logic of doing this stuff with Harry at the movie theater in episode seven and having him drop the F bomb. Yeah. Uh, which I would imagine is not in the comic. Right. I don't think so. I don't think so. Um, like I would imagine including all of that stuff is meant to create the kind of like darkest before the dawn moment to make the like triumph over that or the survival through that sweeter uh and like a more yeah triumphant moment um and i think that's an assumption that's worth challenging like do we need to like you're saying watch characters suffer in order to 
like watch them be happy afterwards <laughs> because like can't we just be just happy have it. exactly <laughs> i don't I, I don't know and i think different people would have different answers to that at, at different degrees um but it's definitely something that you're in for if you're watching this much of the show um and so, like it, it all works out yeah. you know and it all works out day. extremely well uh-huh <laughs> like harry gets suspended and you know, Nick tells his mom, and she's incredible about it. And I cried at that scene. It was so beautiful. Are you kidding? Um, it's so good. Sorry, can we just <laughs> touch on that? Because yeah, yeah. Uh, coming out scenes never work like this. You either get they depict it and it doesn't work, and it's really sad, or they yeah. don't depict it and they're like, "Oh, it worked." Whatever. We never get to specifically see how it quote unquote works in the sense that the parent is accepting. And I love mm-hmm. that the the fact that he's like, "Mom, I think." I'm bisexual. Do you know what that word means? And she says, like, I wasn't born, you know, yesterday. I know that word. That word has existed. And, like, that's a truth is, like, parents today, young people's parents, know what the words mean. Whether or not they accept you is a question. And I am there with Nick in, like, his fear of coming out to his parents. But, like, it can work. And that's, you know, I I think about the, um, like, I think about bell hooks a lot when I talk about the show. Because she Mm. had famously said, you know, to be loving is to be open to grief, to be touched by sorrow, even sorrow that is unending, Um, which is one of her big quotes. And like the whole practice of radical love, because like showing these things going well is radical in its own way. It is, you know, it it is in Mm. itself a pushback against the notion that queer love stories have to feature suffering. And so Mm. in that way, I'm disappointed in episode seven for having so much suffering is because like. You didn't have to. You actually could have done this without yeah. it. And for but, having that physical violence that you rightfully said earlier episodes avoided in yeah. a way that was nice. And then now all of a sudden it's like I'm going to beat the shit out of you because yeah. it's episode seven of an eight episode miniseries. Exactly. And uh, so I, that's that's why I'm like I come out at the end of this saying like I I don't know if I needed it. But at the yeah. same, like, cause, cause the counter argument to like, oh, kids need to see that being out in a gay doesn't always work out is like, just look around. <laughs> like, this is rare. This working well is super rare. We already have enough examples of how mm-hmm. being out yeah. is like dangerous and scary in our real world, in our legislation, in 90% yeah. of queer media. So like, it's actually more interesting and more unique to show that like, it can just work. I'm sure you had and have students in your high school who are queer who are not experiencing daily, you know, assaults and fights like right. this. Right. They yeah. can just live cuz the world is different now. Yeah. Yeah, and as a as a teacher, I've definitely had conversations um, you know, this past year a lot of conversations around gender identity and mm-hmm. students having attitudes towards that that at this point honestly like from my experience as a high school teacher i only really you know teach like my small high school of students and we're in new york city and whatever um so don't know how representative it is of all students but at this point like young people know the terminology they know these things they also know socially that it's like not acceptable to be a huge f- like fucking asshole about it mm-hmm. and st- I mean, some kids are going to like i thought harry was going to sort of do the thing of like oh you're so sensitive like and he kind of says like oh, nobody can take a joke but he doesn't really say it in the way that people say it nowadays yeah it right. feels like it feels like the portrayal of Harry's homophobia is in a way the most outdated part of the show mm-hmm. because homophobia just like looks different now for kids who are on social media to the extent that kids these days are mm-hmm. and aware of these things. Like Harry isn't going to put his arm around someone and be like, what is it like to be gay? Like he knows what it's like to be gay because he's on the internet, you know? Yeah. So his version of, homophobia is going to look uh a little more self-aware more like kind of subtle and then like oh well i didn't say anything technically wrong but i'm being a terrible person um 
And then a lot of it, you know, for my students, it's people who are just kind of like dismissive of um, things like especially pronouns gender, gender stuff, and pronouns, right? Because they're worried about looking ignorant. Mm -hmm. And so for some people, their response is to say like, well, fuck it. I'm just not going to try um, because I don't want to feel I don't want to have the experience of not knowing something and having to learn something and be vulnerable in the fact that I'm like in the process of learning something. Yeah. Um, but I've also had like ex really great experiences with those same students where they're like, okay, like, yeah, I'll, I'll hear this out and I have questions about this and I'm going to like risk vulnerability for a, a short period of time. Um, so I don't know that, that to me just as a teacher, uh, felt the show is so good at the like well what we were talking about before of the positivity in these relationships like the healthiness of these queer relationships it's so great at showing how queer community forms and queer self-identity forms in relation to the internet and it's so bad <laughs> at like ah uh, this freaking homophobic boy said this terrible thing that feels like a, a bully out of an 80s movie or something Bingo. i don't know yeah so i'm that's getting where like seven falters for me totally i'm getting a little emotional thinking about it and because this is like my ultimate thesis with heartstopper is those who say even having watched the pilot like oh this isn't realistic this isn't um the way that being gay feels like in real life like imagine a better world guys you know like let's let's actually try to imagine what it it doesn't have to be realistic this can be aspirational for young teenagers that like i like the boy on the rugby team and oh my god he actually likes me back i want kids to be able to dream about being able to come out to their mm -hmm. parents and it working out yeah. you know the realism isn't the only way to portray every i'm like going to start crying here uh it's not the only way to portray this type of story there is value in yeah. a fantastical beautiful clean romance that just works and yeah. by episode eight you feel like you are baptized in that beach that the boys go to because <laughs> you're free the happiness is i keep saying it it's euphoric um mm -hmm. it just feels so joyous and like the, i'm so yeah. glad episode eight ends the series because the the happiness between nick and charlie this is where i started crying a lot was just like the fact that they got it's through so, so much pure. yeah absolutely man i mean like yeah Everybody, it's like everybody's been blessed by a positivity fairy in this one, you know. Like Tao yeah. and Nick, Tao and Nick get to talk to each other and be like, "Hey, I kind of pushed you away from who's now your boyfriend. I'm really sorry mm -hmm. about that, and I want us to be yeah. in a bigger friend group." Um, yeah. And then, like, all the women of the show start being friends with each other and like talking to each other more. Uh, we get <laughs> the quote unquote conflict of episode A is the sports day, which is the British equivalent of <laughs> like a field day. Yeah. Um, we had field days, right? Yeah, we did. Uh, you're wearing pin pinnies and you're playing sports, and it's like, oh, which one? I don't. I, I'm a better runner. We learned in the first episode that Charlie's a good runner, and so he takes over for Tao because he's worried about like seeing Nick at the or playing rugby there. Uh, and so it's just like everything works, and people play sports, and Stephen Fry is the announcer. Did you catch that? Stephen Fry's. The no, man. I did. I did not. I did not. <laughs> I was like, why do I recognize this British man? And I'm like, oh my god, that's Stephen Fry. <laughs> as their school announcer that's fine and they go privately to a hallway and they share another kiss and it's like the most beautiful thing in the world because it's just the mm. can you stop questioning this and accept it yeah uh and then we have the beach trip also fun cameo when they're on the train going to the beach uh the red-haired woman that's on the the train with them is alice oseman uh, oh, <laughs> she's just and she's drawing and she has a rainbow colored purse. And I was like, bro, <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> she that's kind great. of like takes her her babies a little bit to the beach and lets them have this yeah. like wonderful moment. The line um, that because Nick, Nick Charlie's like, can you read like you really mean it? This isn't a Ben thing. Can you actually tell me you like me? Do you like me or do you like me like me? And uh, Nick says, I like you so much and I like liking you. And I'm, I love I'm, liking you. I love liking you. And I was like, ah. <laughs> speaking of noises yeah. I made during the show, besides yeah. over and over again going, oh, and cute. At this point, I was like <laughs> weepy. Just drenched in tears. Yes. 
That's yeah. absolutely true. Um, and again, showing the talk and having the talk go well is like, yeah, this type of positivity is radical in today's world. I need some yeah. positivity in my life. I don't need that much suffering. Definitely. I don't hate episode seven. I just don't think you need it. The, or maybe there's different considerations to be had when you're making a show, but. Yeah, you know, because sure. maybe that was a Netflix thing. Maybe Netflix was like, you can't just have them. You can't just have them go like, Harry, you're homophobic. Bye. <laughs> like he does in the comic. <laughs> we actually have to have him like be mean. So yeah, I don't know. And and now that they're together, the show can be about okay, what does being in a gay relationship in high school actually look like? Mm-hmm. With like a hel- like one that starts in a healthy place. It can right. be about Isaac reading gender explorers and discovering that they're non-binary. <laughs> <laughs> That's probably what's gonna happen. Yeah, I think so. That's the only representation, really, of that I know of that they haven't touched at all, uh, yeah. <laughs> like the big temple ones. Yeah. But yeah, it's a it's a sweet show. I would say it's heartwarming as hell, and uh, it's very. I hope this inspires some young people to start thinking about themselves a bit. Me too. Me too. Um, should you watch Heartstopper? Yeah, yeah, I think so. I, I, I mean it. I think the value of the show that we're outlining as like presenting this particular world where like things can work out is a value that you can get from the first few episodes. And then if the question is like, should you finish Heartstopper? Um, I mean, do you want to see these characters be happy? Yeah. Keep watching. I mean, like, You don't want to see them go to the beach? What? They have a great beach What's trip. Your What's deal? wrong with you? Why did you go they this far? They have milkshakes. They have milkshakes in episode six. Why, why don't you want to see that? Yeah, come on. Isaac Reed's You don't want to see them hold hands at the movies? Huh? <laughs> the <laughs> ominousness, by the way, of uh, of Ben in the background. And I was like, is he going to see them? And then he's like, I saw you assholes. And I was like, oh, no. <laughs> Fiend. Yeah. But yeah, if you get to watch these things go well. And and ultimately, my recommendation is, yeah, there is enough cynical, depressing media out there about plagues and yeah. time travel and murder and systemic abuse. Sometimes you just got to watch some freaking boys fall in love to some indie music and it's fine. and It's good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes. Sometimes Agreed. that's enough. Love is enough. So, yeah, uh, a huge thumbs up from us uh, at chats for Heartstopper on Netflix. Yeah. Even if it doesn't seem up your alley, I'd say give it a shot. You'll feel good. It's good serotonin. Yeah. You need it. It does a body good. Um, so that's what we have. Did you have any other like little things you wanted to shout out? I wanted to shout out the teacher, by the way. Um, <laughs> I true... actually had a, I had a gripe. <laughs> with, oh, you're talking about the art teacher? Yeah, I'm talking about the gay art teacher. The art teacher is awesome. What that's a great the teacher character. everybody should be. Every teacher should be something like that. Yeah, yeah. I, I loved all the interactions that he had with the art teacher mm-hmm. and that room, the art room, like the set design folks did a fantastic job. When you and that sit shot in the corner, they keep returning to with, uh, with the corner. Yeah. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. There's like flowers on the floor set. around you. It's awesome. Yeah. Um, and you had a bone with the teacher, uh, the, the form, his form teacher being like such a jerk. I was annoyed by that because there's this like moment in the first episode where he's like, ah, let's see where I put you. Nah, you know, whatever. You'll ugh, you'll have a fine year or you won't. You won't talk. And like that wasn't in the comic because no. I read the first one. He is just a guy who's like sit over there and they were like, we're going to make this guy a dick. Come on, hard stopper. Why yeah. are you doing that? It's he's like just British a comedy. form teacher. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But it's unnecessary. I, I agree. That's a little annoying. But mm-hmm. anyway, one of those adaptation things. Exactly. Um, some other stuff I just did. I did really enjoy the graphical touches by the end when they first like their hands go near each other and the sparks fly. Mm-hmm. It's corny, but I am here for it. For the little like, ooh, yes, ooh. yes, yes, yes. Uh, I, I really, really want to shot at episode three for just lighting and music alone. I want that episode to like win an, M- an Emmy or something. Uh, mm-hmm. And uh, more L. If we get a season two, I want to see way more L. I think that actress is awesome. Uh, and yeah, I want to just see her do things at the girls' school. Like, what do they got going on over there? I agree. You know. Um. So that's Heartstopper. It's a great show. You should watch it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Do you want to talk about what we're watching next month? 
for August, we're going to do something that I don't think we've done before on Should You Watch. We're going to watch a show that's in its second season. Is that <gasps> That's new for us, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I recently went to a stand-up show last week where one of the comics was associated with this show that I'd never heard of before um, that I'm excited for us to watch. It's a Showtime show about a couple people living in Brooklyn. One of them's an educator. Uh, Hijinks ensue, apparently. It's called Flatbush Misdemeanors, um, and it is in its second season on Showtime right now. So we're going to watch, we're going to catch up on the show, and we're going to talk about whether you should do the same. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it's set to, this season started in June, and it's going to end on August 21st. So we'll be able to talk about the entire uh, second season by the time oh, we dope. record. And then we can catch yeah. up and be watching it weekly through August. Yeah. Yeah. So Flatbush Misdemeanors, it's on Showtime in the U.S. Find it however you can. And if you don't find it, we'll tell you if you should watch it by the end of the month. Groovy. Um, Magellan, I have to ask you, like I always do, where can people find you online? I'm not on social media, but you can find me on another podcast called Super Smash Echoes. It's a monthly video game podcast that I do with my friend Justin, where we play games in a sort of book club format that are related to the Super Smash Brothers franchise in some way. Uh, so Super Smash Echoes, check us out over there. Alan, what about you? I am uh, co-hosting two other podcasts, one of which is The Hunter's Quorum, formerly known as The Jota Quorum, where my friend Six and I and our friend Casey, A.K. Manofsky, talk about the monsters of the Monster Hunter video game franchise. Um, what makes them cool, what makes them funny, what makes them weird, all of that good stuff. Um, we've been playing a lot of Sunbreak together and having a great time. So if you care about Monster Hunter or video games or people joking about video games, then check out The Hunter's Quorum. Uh, I'm also the director of content for the American Marketing Association in Boston which primarily means that I host and produce their podcast, Talking Marketing, which is a bi-monthly show where we interview marketing professionals from around the world and interview them about their craft and what makes their job interesting and uh, what they like about it. So check out Talking Marketing. We have some really cool episodes of that coming out soon. I just recorded one that I was thrilled by, and uh, I think people will get a kick out of it even if you don't care about marketing. Um, that brings us to our plug zone for chats. Magellan, did you want to take this one, please? Sure. You can get in touch with the show in a couple different ways. You can email us at chatspod at gmail.com. You can also follow us on Twitter, twitter.com slash chatspod. You can join fellow listeners in discussions about current and former seasons of chats over at reddit.com slash r slash chatspod. And you can also join fellow listeners on our Discord, which is a benefit for our patrons, a dollar and up. But also, uh, if you don't have the cash or the desire to support us on Patreon, but you want to be on the Discord, let us know, and uh, we'll, we'll sneak you in the back door. It'll be okay. Speaking of Patreon... A dollar a month and up gets you access to assorted bonus content in the Discord. Three dollars and up gets you access to twice monthly bonus content, one of which will be an episode selected by us, one of which will be an episode selected by uh, Chance. We'll, we'll, we'll put a theme out there, put some thoughts on a wheel, spin the wheel. There's a wheel spin video. It's all it's a it's a real production over there on the chat's Patreon. And then five dollars a month gets you thanked at the end of the show. Uh, Alan, do you have that list? Could you do that? Thank you to our $5 chatsums who are as follows. Arthur, Chloe, Jen, Kat, Lee, Magellan's mom, Marcus, Marin, Michael, Nick and Pat of the Brothers at Infinite War, Fenden, Six, and Stefan. Thank you for supporting Chats Television Podcast. Uh, you can also support the show by rating us on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to podcasts by sharing the show with folks. Um, oh, and this is Should You Watch. If you're listening on the Should You Watch feed, we have a whole other feed that's a main feed where we talk about shows on a weekly basis and not just a monthly basis. Um, and then we have a website, chatspot.com. We have someone who helped design our podcast art at Camillustrator on uh, the, the socials. And uh, that's that's our deal. Thank you for listening, folks. We greatly, greatly appreciate it. This is a joy for us to do, to watch TV, to talk about TV, and to hang out with all of you and with each other. Um, so, yeah, thank you. And uh, we'll catch you next month with Flatbush Misdemeanors. Bye, Alan. Bye, Magellan. Bye, everyone.